Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and thank you so much for tuning in today. First of all, if you're watching this, and this channel has already passed over the 100,000 subscriber mark, I just want to give a sincere thank you to each and every one of you for supporting the work I'm doing here. It means a lot. Now, it's absolutely no secret that adventure bikes are becoming very, very popular and becoming very mainstream in the motorcycle world. Even for motorcycle riders who don't care at all about going off-road, adventure bikes with their upright riding position, their comfortable ergonomics, their everyday practicality, their rugged good looks have become extremely popular. This is extremely similar to the automotive world here where I live in the USA, where we've seen SUVs almost completely replace the traditional four-door sedans of yesteryear. With BMW selling over 60,000 units last year alone, most of which had a transaction price of around $25,000 US, if not even more, it's no wonder that Triumph wants to get a piece of this very, very lucrative pie. The flavor of that pie being expensive, high-tech, feature-laden, full-size adventure bikes like this Tiger 1200. For 2022, Triumph have completely revamped their Tiger 1200. Everything you see here is new. It's a ground-up redesign. Chassis, engine, electronics, everything. And of course, headlining the big changes is a massive drop in weight of about 60 pounds compared to the outgoing Tiger 1200 Explorer series. Coming in around 15 pounds lighter and with about 15 more horsepower than a comparable GS model, BMW definitely has something to worry about. The Tiger 1200 is available in five distinct models, which we'll cover in a minute. But for today's video, we're gonna focus our review on this model, the GT Pro, which is a road-focused version of the new Tiger 1200. I think the big question is maybe the elephant in the room, and hopefully I can help address this since I've owned so many late model GSs, is, is the new Tiger 1200 good enough to compete directly head-on with the GS, especially considering it costs almost exactly the same? Here's what you can expect in today's video. We're gonna go through all the model specs and pricing. We're gonna give you an overview of the five different models of the new Tiger 1200. We'll take a tour of the bike, show you all its specs and features, show you the riding position. We're gonna get it out on a highway, show you how this thing performs in the twisties and on the highway for more straight roads. Then we're gonna come back here, we're gonna discuss the pros, the cons, we're gonna talk about the competition. And finally, we'll end with some final thoughts and talking about whether I would choose this over a new BMW GS. So with that, let's go for a ride. All right, so before we go any further, I think it's important we just briefly talk about the different models to help you understand where this GT Pro sits in the model range. The Tiger 1200 comes in five different models and it can be a little bit confusing. Now, in order to alleviate this confusion and give you as a potential buyer, uh, some really good consumer information, uh, I've compiled a little uh, spreadsheet or a little chart showing the five different Tiger 1200 models and the main differences in pricing, weight, specs, and equipment. I'm gonna make that available for free download below, no strings attached. I'll put some links in the video description if you wanna download that, if you're a serious shopper for this bike or you just like to geek out on the details. So in summary, again, you can download that file if you want all the details, but in summary, how this works is the GT models are the road focus models. They have the 19 inch front wheels instead of the 21 inch front wheels. They're lower to the ground because they have less suspension travel and less ground clearance. And the features are set up more for on-road riding as opposed to the rally models that are set up for off-road riding. Now, the other thing that comes into play here is when you see the Explorer. So the Explorer models, which are available both as a GT Explorer or a rally Explorer, are essentially, if you're familiar with the BMW GS Adventure, it's the same kind of thing as that. So what you get on the Explorer, you get a few more features like the blind spot radar, the heated seats, uh, but you mainly what you get with that Explorer is a larger fuel tank. It goes up from just over five gallons to just under eight gallons or from about 20 liters to about 30 liters, which is, happens to be exactly the same if you go from a standard 1250 GS to a GS Adventure 1250. So again, Download my uh, guide there, look at my guide here on the screen to see the differences in the models, but I just wanted to give you an overview of where this sits within the range. All right, so let's take a look at the seat height, riding position, and ergonomics of this model. So the seat height on the GT models is 33 and a half inches, and I'll put the um, metric equivalent here. That's with the seat in a low position. 
or you can raise it up about an inch to 34.5 uh, inches. On the rally models, you're going up about an inch from those measurements. So with that in mind, let's jump on board here and take a look at the riding position. All right, so I am five foot 10 or about 180 centimeters. I weigh about 195 pounds. I'll put the metric stuff here and I can pretty much flat foot this bike on both sides. So I feel like it's uh, relatively low to the ground for a big adventure bike. 33 and a half inches is maybe a little bit lower than average. So that's gonna be good for vertically challenged folks. The riding position, uh, as you can see here, I've got a lot of leg room. My knee is at a very comfortable angle. Uh, it has the, the tiniest of forward leans, although of course you could adjust the handlebar and the clamps if you wanted to. But overall, it's a typical upright adventure motorcycle riding position. I think it'd be good for taller people. If you're really short, then all adventure bikes are gonna be too tall for you. All right, let's talk about the specs and features and take you on a tour around this bike and then we'll get out for a nice ride. Let's start with the most important thing, the engine. So you've got an inline three-cylinder engine, liquid-cooled, obviously. Uh, it is a 13.2 to 1 compression ratio. And in this state of tune, it puts out around 148 horsepower, uh, which is around 110 kilowatts. And that power comes in at 9,000 RPM. If I walk around here, you can see the distinctive three outlet exhaust here showing you that it is indeed the famous Triumph three cylinder engine. For torque, you're looking at 95 foot pounds of torque or about 130 Newton meters, and that comes in 7,000 RPM. That engine is hooked up to a six speed uh, clutch with a slip assist clutch feature. And of course it's got the shaft final drive, which is very, very nice. And you can see it's a relatively low profile shaft drive system. It also makes for kind of an interesting swing arm arrangement. Uh, you can see the swing arm kind of comes out and then drops down to make room for this sort of linkage setup, which is probably to control the motions of the shaft drive system. Let's take a look at the frame for a minute. So you do have a bolt-on removable rear subframe, which is great in case you were somehow to damage the rear subframe. You could replace that as a piece instead of totaling out the whole frame. Let's look at the tires and wheels. So you've got a 19-inch front tire and an 18-inch rear tire, and you've got a 120 width on the front and a 150 width in the back. So it's not that wide. That might contribute to sort of that agile handling. The tires that they're coming with for this model year and this trim are the Metzler Turrence Next. So they're a very road-oriented tire. They're not meant to be taken off-road. Let's talk about the brakes and then the suspension. So for brakes, you have these four piston Brembo Stylema calipers, which are very, very high end braking unit, uh, hooked up to twin uh, 320 millimeter discs in the front. And then on the back, you have a single 280 millimeter disc hooked up to a uh, single piston caliper. Now let's talk about the suspension very quickly. So this is the Showa EERA or Electronic Ride Adjustment, uh, Electronically Controlled Semi-Active Dynamic Suspension. So it adjusts as you're riding based on the road conditions. You can also do a lot of adjustments through the computer. You have around 7.9 inches of travel in the front and 7.9 in the back, around 200 millimeters front and back. Our fuel tank capacity is 5.3 gallons or 20 liters. And our overall curb weight fully fueled up is about 540 pounds. So with the specs out of the way, let's take you on a tour around the motorcycle. So in the front of the motorcycle, you can see you've got the lower front fender, you've got the upper, sometimes you call this a beak or the upper front fender, which gives it that kind of adventure styling. You can see the fog lights here, which come on many of the models in the range, except the base model. LED turn signals there. The headlight is this wide headlight with this kind of bar style running light, which I think looks really unique. And then you've got the high and low beams here, um, which uh, are of course all LED. Then you have the pretty large adjustable windshield. You simply grab the windshield to move it up or down, or you can grab this bar and do it like that. You can see the bike has these plastic hand guards and we'll get to the cockpit here in a minute. So coming around this side, you can see the upper fairing. You've got radiators uh, housed up, up in here. You can see the uh, trellis style frame. You've got the 
engine cases down here which are very nicely finished on this kind of matte finish the foot pegs have a rubber cover which you can remove if you want to have the metal pegs for for additional traction you can see here's our rear brake lever which actually is adjustable i believe you can um, push this into a different position or oh, maybe not on this model but i think on some of them you can flip it around um, but this retracts in case you were to drop the bike you can see the passenger pegs which bolt onto the subframe which is a nice thing to have the exhaust looks like you've got a catalytic converter down in here the exhaust is actually fairly trim and sleek for a modern euro 5 compliant motorcycle you can see the dual seat with the rider seat being quite a bit lower than the passenger seat the grab handle sear small rear rack Coming around to the back, you can see that single disc we talked about, rear mud guard here to prevent the spray from coming up, rear fender arrangement, LED tail light. The turn signals, the reason that they're red is that when you hit the brakes, they activate as a brake light. So you've got three brake lights. That's very unique, innovative, and I wish every manufacturer would adopt that huge safety feature to have those additional brake lights um, when you're coming to a stop. Now coming around this side of the bike, you can see we've got, this is a module for the damping for the rear uh, suspension. So electronic suspension bikes, you see this uh, something that you're going to have. Then you've got, of course, the passenger peg on this side. You've got a center stand, side stand, which both work very smoothly. It's easy to get the bike up on a center stand, which was a nice thing. Uh, coming up here, you've got kind of this rubber protector here, so your jacket or pants don't scratch up the tank. Uh, and then you've got, so these bikes are keyless ride, they're all keyless ride, and to get into the fuel tank, you simply hit this twice, or pick this up twice, and then you're able to get into the fuel tank, and to close it, simply the reverse of that. Let's jump on and kind of show you the cockpit and controls here. So starting at the left, you can see it's a hydraulic clutch. Uh, you've got buttons here for the heated seat, which this model does not have. You have to go to the upgraded models to get that. Then you've got a switch for the driving lights. I'm going to turn off the hazard lights there. Uh, switch for the fog lights there. And the high beam switch here, which is toggle on and off. The cruise control, which is uh, two buttons up and down. You, to activate the system, you hit set, and then you hit set again to set your speed, then you can go up and down. Heated grip button is indicated is, uh, sorry integrated into the grips. Then you've got a riding mode button here to change your riding mode uh, between your different riding modes. And depending on what model you get, you have different riding modes available. So this bike has road, sport, off-road, and rider mode. So that's nice there that you have those things. And in rider mode, of course, you can configure, you know, your ABS, MAP, traction control, suspension damping in the way you want to do that. So very nice ability to customize it there. Then you have a turn signal here, and then you have the horn, and then you have the uh, menu controller, which is right where the turn signals normally are. So every time I go to hit the turn signal, I end up going into my menu system. So that's something that you probably need to keep in mind. Working our way around here, you can see the black tubular handlebar. You've got this uh, bar clamp here. This is Tiger on it. That's a nice touch. The brake reservoirs, of course. Over here on this side, you've got a lock button. I don't know what that locks, but I'll put that here in the, uh, the, in the text, but it does lock something. And you have the hazard lights button, and then you have this multifunction uh, start, stop, uh, run switch here. Then you have a home button, which takes you back you know, it, can, it gets rid of your settings that you're changing and takes you back to the main dashboard screen. Looks like we have a visitor here interrupting the filming. Too cute. Are you helping to film the review of the Triumph Tiger? Oh, you have a cute hat, sweetheart. Very cute hat. So looking at the controls and the TFT, it's a very large full color TFT on this bike. You get this large speedometer and then you get a fuel gauge here and you get the different indications on your sides. Now uh, you can, to go into the settings, to change settings or customize things, there's a few different ways you can do it. You've got this four-way controller here, which is where the turn signals normally is, <laughs> so that's above it. And then you've also got this home button. So you can hit either one to get into the menu. So if we hit the button, now you can go in here, and now you can use your four-way joystick uh, to go in here. So you've got um, display settings here, right? You can set the brightness, the theme, the unit, state and time. You can set rider profiles. If we go down here to this next icon, this goes into the bike settings, so riding aids. 
So if we go into writing aids, uh, you can you know go in here and customize traction control, uh, mapping, ABS, uh, things like that. So we'll set the suspension here to normal damping. Okay, and then if we then here now you can go into damping by itself, and you can set uh, the on-road damping just because that's the mode we're in, and how much firmness or softness you want to get there. Uh, you can go down here, various settings, uh, things like that. So, you can, like you can turn off the traction control, shift assist, hill hold. This bike does have hill hold assist. You can do things like that. So overall, these menus are pretty easy to navigate. If you go down one more, you can go into your trip and your fuel status here. So if we go into fuel status, you can see like your averages and your fuel range and things like that. If we go back out of that and we go down to the Bluetooth setting, you can connect to your phone and do things like messaging, music, navigation. You can even control a GoPro camera through here, which is really kind of cool. We're not gonna get into all that now because this video would be six hours long, but. So let's go ahead. So when you notice, when you go into the menu, it shifts your, because you can do this while riding, it shifts to the speedometer and, and uh, stuff like that over, and then you get your menu there. And then to go back, you hit the home button and you get back to your main screen. Okay, let's start this Tiger. Punch it. Punch it again. I just can't get enough of this sound. Okay, one more good acceleration run here. Oh, ho, ho. holy moly. Whoever said adventure bikes were slow, man, they need to reevaluate that. Okay, so now that I've thoroughly showed you how this thing sounds and kind of how it accelerates. So talk about the rest of the stuff. So yeah, the bike is, is pretty quick. 150 horsepower is no slouch. 95 foot pounds of torque. This thing can move. And you've already heard the induction noise, but man, do I love the way this sounds. So this bike has kind of two personalities. If you ride it kind of slow and short shift it, you never really hear that engine, that induction noise. But if you're anything above like 4,000 RPM, and you go full throttle like this that's when you get that roaring sound oh man that never gets old i'm telling you okay let's talk about the handling so this gt version with the shorter suspension the 19 inch front wheel it's very agile it responds to your input very quickly these wide handlebars give you a ton of leverage and so as a sport touring bike hitting the twisties, this thing doesn't leave much to be desired. And it's definitely one of the best handling uh, adventure bikes that I've ever ridden. Let's talk about the brakes. So let me show you the braking performance of the bike. 65 miles an hour. That's brake is all the way and I'm feeling seasick honestly I get nauseous doing that these brakes are very very powerful they have nice progressive initial feel but when you clamp down like when you clamp down you're stopping now like you can see the quick shifter there I honestly feel seasick from doing that uh, these brakes are very very good Let's talk next about the uh, overall comfort and the wind protection and everything like that. So 
I've got the windshield all the way up because it makes the airflow quieter for capturing this audio. If I push this down, first of all, I like that because I can either grab the bar or I can just grab the top of the windshield. If I put it down all the way, I do get air hitting me about halfway up my helmet. And I'm wearing a, a helmet with a visor or a peak, a dual sport helmet, and I do get I do get a decent amount of buffeting, but it's not terrible. I'd say it's about average for an adventure bike. If I put the windshield all the way up, I get mostly clean air. I do get a little bit of wind kind of hitting me in the very top of my visor, which at high speeds, so 70, 75, it's still pretty quiet if I duck down very serene to cruise at you know these higher speeds but there's a tiny bit of wind buffeting if the windshield was maybe an inch taller I think it would pretty much cure it for me so there's a story on that you can see it does have these side wind deflectors here uh, which I think help push the wind out kind of around your shoulders and everything lower body wind protection there's not a whole lot there's just kind of deflectors here so there's some deflection there but it's it's not a ton um, it's not something like a, a GSA, but I'd say it's comparable with like a normal GS. Quick shifter works very smoothly. One of the smoothest quick shifters that I've tried, so very, very happy with that. And then we've already covered the acceleration, but what the hell. Going downhill into a right-hand corner. But I have a lot of confidence in this bike. It really allows you to ride like a sport touring bike, you know, very fast. Now all these bumps in the road, if I go in and I change the suspension, this is why electronic suspension is so cool. So watch this. If I dial out the damping all the way to comfort, what you're gonna what I'm gonna notice, it probably doesn't come through in video, is that all these bumps have almost disappeared. I don't really feel them anymore. But if I put the damping all the way up to sport like this now the ride is a lot more harsh i feel the impacts of all these little bumps in the road but the bike is more responsive and more agile and better in the corners because it doesn't it has very firm damping so i think there's like nine or ten levels here uh so let's just set it back to normal and go with that the bike has a lot of engine braking that's something i have noticed which i kind of like coming into these corners and let the engine brake in do quite a bit of the work. Damn, this thing is good on a twisty road. The problem is I just can't seem to ride this bike slow. I just want to ride kind of like an a-hole everywhere because it's just too much fun. This thing is a sport touring beast. There's really not much to complain about here from a highway point of view, whether it's cruising along at 75 miles an hour without much wind buffeting or whether it's tearing up these twisties or letting this engine eat and have its, have its head. <laughs> This bike is engaging and fun to ride. So with that, uh, let's get back to the driveway, get into the pros and cons, the competition, and then we'll have some final thoughts. Maximum warp, engage. All right, we're back from our ride. I hope all of you enjoyed that as much as I did on this beautiful late spring or early summer day. So let's talk about the pros and cons as I see it to the 1200 GT Pro. Here are the things I like about it, trying to be as brief as I can. A lot of this has already probably come through in the riding impressions when we're out on the road. I like the power and the refinement and the comfort. The engine sounds incredible. It um, has a great uh, feeling of a lot of power, really good acceleration. The overall comfort of the bike, the riding position, the wind protection, weather protection, the ergonomics, everything comes together and it gives you a very luxurious riding experience. Another thing I really like about this bike is the range of adjustment with the Showa electronic suspension. So 
Unlike the BMW GS models, and this is something I've complained about in my review of those bikes after having owned them, is that with this you get a much more finer control over the damping. So you have like nine levels of damping uh, you can choose from. So if you want a soft floaty ride, you can have that. If you want a moderately aggressive ride, you can have that. And if you want a really firm ride for super sporty riding on tight twisty roads or riding aggressively off-road, you can do that as well. So I really like the amount of adjustment they give you for the suspension. A couple other things I really like about this bike, of course the shaft drive is a wonderful thing to have for long distance riding or even for commuting or just owning it as a motorcycle because there's almost no maintenance. Oil changes on the final drive will be a very long interval as compared to lubing and tensioning and cleaning a chain, not to mention the mess that a chain makes on the rear of your motorcycle. So I really, really like the shaft drive. The other thing I really like about it is the motorcycle does not feel that heavy. I think they've done a good job centralizing the weight kind of down here fairly low, uh, even though it doesn't have the advantage of the boxer engine that the BMW has. This actually to me feels maybe a tiny bit lighter than a 1250 GS. Uh, the seat's relatively low. Overall, the bike feels tight and compact for a large 1200cc adventure tour. It doesn't feel intimidating or tippy or top heavy. And these are things that really matter every day if you're gonna own this bike. So what are some cons to the Tiger 1200 uh, GT Pro? So the switch gear is, it, the placement is very weird of the menu joystick controller. Uh, it's kind of reversed with the turn signal controller in my opinion. So every time I try to go to use my turn signal, I end up going into the menu and not activating the turn signal just because that menu button is right where the turn signal switch is on most every other motorcycle. So. If you own the bike, you're gonna get used to it. It's gonna take some time to get used to it. I think you would eventually, but if you're riding it for the first time, I guarantee you the same thing is gonna to happen to you. Another thing that I found to be a slight negative was that even with the couple hour rides that I've been doing with this bike uh, since I've had it the past few weeks, the seat feels on the soft side and a soft seat may feel comfortable initially or in a showroom, but what I've learned is that if the seat feels really soft, it's gonna be uncomfortable to ride all day. Now I can't verify that, so don't hold me to it, but I'm a little worried about the seat comfort for longer days. Couple other things to keep in mind with uh, this Tiger. The engine vibration, people have talked about this a lot uh, with the Tiger 900, and I did cover that, and also now with the 1200, people are talking about the vibration. So because of the way the firing order is, and because it's an inline three-cylinder engine, there are vibrations that come through the handlebars and the motorcycle at certain RPMs, so it's like these resonant frequencies. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what all those frequencies are. Uh, you feel some vibes like at idle, and then sometimes like above five or 6,000 RPM, you feel the vibration as well. But most of the speeds you're gonna be cruising at around 60, 70, 75 miles an hour or around the 100 to 110 kilometer per hour range, you don't feel much vibration at those speeds. And the bike has very tall gearing. So I don't think it's gonna be an issue for a lot of people, uh, but it's something to keep in mind and you should definitely test ride it. Another potential con, and this isn't so much a con for the GT Pro as it is for the 1200 in general, and I think it's gonna come in more to play when I do the 1200 rally coming up in a few weeks, is that Unlike the BMW GS Boxer, which never wants to really stall, it just has that really good low-end fueling, the fueling on this is not quite as uh, smooth. It's a little more abrupt, but in addition to a little bit of the abrupt kind of on-off fueling, it also has a little bit more tendency to stall at very low RPMs or very low speeds. So that part is not quite perfect, uh, but it's also very common for modern motorcycles to have this. So it's not a big negative, it's just something that I wanted to mention. All right, let's talk about the competition for the Tiger 1200. Now keep in mind, this is available in five versions like we've talked about. So depending on what version you're looking at, it kind of changes slightly what would be more of a direct competitor when you're looking at these bikes. But if we have to break this down, I think there's really four major players as direct competitors. Now when I say direct competitors, you have to look at the price, the features, the technology, and the power, and so forth. So obviously you have the BMW R1250 GS, which this bike was pretty much obviously like aimed directly at. You have Harley's uh, Pan America, you have the Ducati Multistrada, and you have the KTM 1290 Super Adventure, which has a more street version, and they have the R version on that as well. Now, yes, I know some of you right now are thinking, well, what about the Yamaha Super Tenere? What about the V-Strom 1050? Those bikes are great, 
but those are priced at a lower level. They're more value oriented. They're much older platforms. They don't have the technology and the performance of these uh, five bikes that we're talking about right now. So just keep that in mind and no offense to anybody that has those bikes. So how does this bike compare to the four bikes that I mentioned? Um, so there's a, a lot to discuss here. How do, how do I try to keep this brief? So there's a couple ways that the Triumph is really uh, unique versus those other competitors. So if you look at all the competition I mentioned, uh, with the exception of the uh, four cylinder, the V4 version of the Multistrada, they're all two cylinder, uh, twin cylinder bikes. So this is the only three cylinder. So three cylinder is something that's made Triumph unique for a long time. Now, it should be said that because of the different firing order that they've gone to on these new motors, they don't feel, uh, they don't have the creamy smoothness and sort of the high pitch whine uh, and growl that the older Tigers did with the old uh, three cylinder engines. So they actually feel a bit more like a cross between a twin and a triple. They feel more like a twin actually in some ways with the way they sound and they have a bit lower end power than they used to. Uh, but still, it's the only bike with a three cylinder. If that's something that really appeals to you, then that's a distinguishing feature. All of the bikes that we're talking about here, the GS, the Multistrada, the KTM, the Harley, and this Tiger 1200, uh, they're all super high tech, super powerful, super comfortable, uh, luxurious, safe. They have all the modern technology. Any of them would be an amazing motorcycle to own. So a lot of you are gonna have a brand preference. Maybe you're loyal to a certain brand. Maybe you have a dealer that you like that carries a certain uh, brand or range of bikes. Maybe your friends ride a certain kind of bike. Maybe you like the styling of one over the other. And I wouldn't fault you for using any of those reasons to purchase any of those bikes over this. They're all very, very good. Now, if you simply are a horsepower junkie and you want the most power, 150 horsepower is nothing to sneeze at, but the KTM has more power. I think it's around 160 horsepower. And the Ducati, especially if you get the V4, has 20 more horsepower on 170. So you can get into the horsepower wars if you want. To some people, that's important, and I respect that. That's fine. Uh, then you might want to look at those bikes. If you're more oriented to off-road riding, then something interesting about the Tiger is the only one available, at least in the rally models, with a 21 inch front wheel. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. How does this compare to a BMW GS? So I've owned several late model GSs if you follow my channel and watch some of my other videos and I'll link some of my GS reviews here. What Triumph has managed to do is they've managed to match a lot of the specifications almost to the exact decimal point with the BMW GS, which I think is very, very interesting. If you look at the fuel capacity of this and the Explorer versus the GS and the GS Adventure, uh, you look at some things like the suspension travel, uh, the seat heights, even a lot of the pricing uh, structure, it's almost identical to the GS. So obviously these bikes are in very close competition with each other. So there's a few important differences we need to talk about here. One of the main differences you're gonna notice if you test both of these bikes is they have a very different way that they deliver power. The Triumph with using the three cylinder makes its horsepower and torque higher in the RPM range than the Boxer motor. So the Boxer 1250 uh, shift cam motor makes its torque lower and it also makes more torque. So the BMW has about 10 more foot pounds of torque than the Triumph. The Triumph has around uh, 14, 15 more horsepower than the BMW. So you're trading off, you're getting more horsepower here, but you're getting less torque. So depending on what you prefer, you can make your decision. Torque is that twisting force that you feel at low RPM kind of pushing you along. Horsepower is that feeling you get at the higher RPMs when the bike's rushing forward and accelerating. So they're different sensations, but ultimately they're kind of, they're kind of actually measuring the same thing. Uh, but the way they come across in the real world is a, is a real big riding difference that you really need to test both to see what you prefer. A few other points of comparison. The Tiger 1200 gives you more uh, options to choose from than the GS model. So with BMW, you've got the GS and the GS Adventure. There are some options within that, but that's basically it. Triumph gives you a lot more choices. So you have the GT, GT Pro, GT Explorer. Uh, then if you want to go off-roading, you have two choices there and you can get that 21 inch front wheel, which is very unique because BMW, you cannot get a 21 inch front wheel on the big GS. You have to go down to the 850 GS to get that. So you get a lot more uh, selection of choices with a Triumph, which I think is a really, really good and valuable thing because some people like to ride off-road and some people don't. And Triumph gives you that option to choose from. Another big difference that you need to 
consider when making this choice. The BMW uses a telelever front suspension. I'll put a photo of it here. It's like, a, it's like an A-arm type suspension. And what it does is that when you're under hard braking on the GS, you don't feel the motorcycle pitching forward very much at all. It gives you a very stable, very secure feeling. A lot of people like it. They feel more secure. They feel they can brake in shorter distances. And they feel better when they're carrying luggage and passenger because of the way that it handles the weight. It also tends to ride very, very smoothly and does ride smoother than this. Uh, on the road. Now off-road, the traditional fork is gonna be better, offers more adjustment and a more direct feel. Also on the highway, a traditional fork offers better road feel. You feel more connected to what the, hap what's happening on the road, uh, more communication through the handlebars of the terrain uh, as you're going through corners than you do with the BMW tail lever, which can feel vague. So it's simply a trade-off. You're gonna to have to decide which one you like better, but it's a big difference. Couple other things that are hard to argue with on the BMW. The BMW, because the boxer engine, you need to put crash cages on it and protection, but when you do drop it, it only drops like this instead of all the way over like this bike will. I'm not dropping this one because it's too new of a bike and I don't want to scratch it up. Uh, but the GS will be easier to lift than this by quite a big margin. So that's something that you need to definitely keep in mind. Final thoughts on Triumph's Tiger 1200 GT Pro. I've said a lot about this motorcycle and I've made a lot of comparisons to bikes like the BMW GS. But to be more fair to this bike and the Triumph, it might also be good to look at this bike by itself and stop comparing it to everything else. Even though it does stand up really, really well to those comparisons, when you look at it by itself and consider what it is, it's an amazing motorcycle by every single measure. It's fast. It handles really well, it's agile, it's comfortable, it's sporty, it has good weather protection. The technology is amazing, the safety is really, really good, the, the rider aids. Uh, the engine has a lot of character, it's super fun to ride, it makes a great noise. Maintenance will be relatively easy because you have a shaft drive and not a chain drive. There's really very difficult to come up with things to complain about uh, on this motorcycle. When I'm riding this bike, the GT Pro 1200 Tiger, I really get the sense that why would anybody ride this and then go and buy a traditional sport touring bike? My feeling when riding this is that this is the evolution. This is the modern sport touring bike. This is more utilitarian, more versatile, more practical. In my opinion, more comfortable because of the ergonomics. You can do more things with it. In some cases, it costs less than some of those bikes. In some cases, it costs more. That's something you're gonna to have to look at. You don't have to have all the plastic of, of a huge fairing. The only thing that a traditional sport touring bike would potentially do better would be sustained high-speed riding like Autobahn riding where you wanna sustain you know, 130, 150 miles per hour and you need the aerodynamic advantage of a full fairing. But besides that, why wouldn't you get something like this or a GS or a Multistrada? or a KTM 1290, or a Harley Pan America. And the truth is, people are. That's what people are buying. That's why these bikes are becoming so popular and why a company like Triumph is spending so much money and effort to develop this platform. There's truly nothing on this Tiger 1200 that stands out as being below average or subpar or a place where they cut corners. This was a ground up redesigned motorcycle. And I'm super excited for this platform, not only in, in this form, but also testing the Rally models, which I have actually picking up the 1200 Rally Pro in a couple of days. I'm really excited about that, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this is an extremely fully developed, mature, incredible platform that I think Triumph is gonna do really, really well with. And whether you wanna compare it to the GS or not, it stands up really well to the GS. And if I was forced to pick one or the other today, I think I'd buy the Tiger. There's just enough things pushing me over the edge on the Tiger uh, versus the GS uh, that I think would, would push me that direction. But here's something also to keep in mind. BMW has a new GS coming out sometime in the next year or two, it could be sooner. We don't really know for sure and BMW won't tell me anything. But the current GS came out in 2013, nine years ago, and Triumph is just finally able to sort of catch up in terms of making a bike to compete with that platform, that nine-year-old platform. So if that's the case, how good is that new GS gonna be? How much better is it gonna be than everything else? I guess time will tell, and that's just a guess, but the new GS is something that I definitely am watching very closely for uh, to see if they're able to make that quantum leap once again and sort of 
get ahead of everybody else. So this video is very, very long. I apologize for that. I wanted to go in detail on this bike. I hope you found it useful. Check out the Tiger 1200 and stay tuned for reviews on the other models in this range. I'll be featuring those here on my channel. Please support Big Rock Moto. There's ways to do that in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. Please ride safe and I'll see you out there. With BMW selling over 60,000 models of their famed GS motorcycle last year, With BMW having sold over 60,000 GSs last year alone, it's no wonder that Triumph wants to get a piece of this very lucrative pie. With BMW selling over 60,000 units of the GS last year alone, it's no wonder that Triumph wants to get a piece, or even maybe a really big piece, of this lucrative pie. With BMW selling over 60,000 GSs last year alone, most of which had a tra With BMW selling over 60,000 units of the GS last year alone, most of which For 2022, Triumph have come out swinging and they've completely redone for 2022, Triumph have come out swinging and they've completely revamped their Tiger 1200 line. This bike has an all new chassis, 